That means it's recording now. Okay, good. You, you remember that I end last lec lecture with the questions. So the question is how to test QCD in a reaction with identified hydrons, which is necessary for us to see any details of a hydronic structures. So then uh, the fact that I mentioned any hydronic scale, the physics at the hydronic scale is order of lambda QCD, which is non-perturbative. So then uh, what the solution I mentioned is known as QCD factorization. I want to emphasize before anything, QCD factorization is approximation. That's very, very important. Some people I remember, including a lot of my students in the early days, but they are now good. Then they think that this is really one plus one equal two. It's a proof. No, it's a one plus one equal to two plus minus something. Okay, so that's keep that in your mind. We have to demonstrate the correction to the factorized formula is under control. That's very important. So now, before I do anything, I'm going to give you a very intuitive example. It's not moving. <laughs> okay, good, thank you. So the first I give you a really instructive exercise. I'm sure everyone can carry out without any problem, but I put in a way, give you the mathematical essence of the factorization. They, of course, have to prove it. So I start with a simple example. Consider the cross section depend on two scale. Remember, I mentioned factorization is always related to how to separate physics at a different scale. Imagine the cross section, I have a hard scale Q and the, and the soft scale M squared. So the Q squared is much larger than M squared. That's the only condition I have. So I can imagine myself, I can write down this in terms of. Uh, uh, a normalization sigma zero, one plus alpha s correction plus alpha s square term. So this I depend on two scale, I call them say leading order quantum correction because leading order means proportion alpha s. I give a very simple example. Everyone can follow mathematically. You say this I equal to the integral of the phase space k square. Then the k square have two type of term typical I will show you in the real life that very, very much like that. Then you can have one over k square plus m square and the q square over the q square plus k square. First of all, you know, this quantity i is dimensionless. That's important because that's coefficient of alpha s should not have any dimension. Number two has two scale. Then you know when a k square is the order of m, this becomes a really important division. Then when k square is the order of a q square, then this is the order of one. So let me do the so-called leading power contribution from this integral. If you look at, I can break this integration into two regions. One is a k square much less than q square, and another region k square the order of a q square. So in that case, the first term because the k square much less than the q square, so it's integral over dk square over k square plus mass. Then the next one is the integral of a k square over one over k square, q square plus q square plus k square. Then plus the power correction, m square over q square. That sounds like exactly what we try to do to the power expansion. Then the important thing is that, then this m help you to regularize divergence when k square go to zero. And also this is important, then notice that when k square goes, because k square order of q, this is never really go to zero. So this is a, have no divergence from the region of a k square go to zero, but could have ultraviolet divergence when k square go to infinity. That's the one eventually you have to renormalize to give logarithm divergence. So with this separation, I can substitute into this expression, what you see. You will see the cross section can be written as the product of two terms. First term is the one plus alpha s multiplied this term. Second is the one plus alpha multiplied this term. So then plus order of alpha s correct square correction and the power corrections. 
So if I define the first term as a perturbative version of the pattern distribution function or any distribution represent long distance physics, then the second term is a one plus alpha as a correction that presents short distance physics with a correction of m square over q square. So you can see any of this type of integral, you can break into two regions. But of course, what's the high order correction? And also you like to ask, say, well, this is a cross section in the probability. I effectively write a probability in terms of the product of two probability. Imagine this is the quantity is a probability convolute another probability. Now you say in the quantum theory, everything is the amplitude square. If you have a one probability as a square, total thing square, you want to break into a product of two probability. There must be the approximation because they're all the quantum difference between different scale. So what the factorization try to do is try to prove the link between these two is by the particle, which is a factory on mass show can be treated as a classical. That means the quantum correlation between the first and the second will be power suppressed. So that's a quick summary at the, what the factorization will do, but I want to prove to you. For arbitrary physical observable, if they, we claim the factorizable, I have to prove to you, can be separated the physics at the two different scale. Second, I have to prove the connection between them, corresponding particle almost leave on the mass show. That means I can be treated as classical. Then third is all the quantum difference between them have to be power suppressed. I can control that. So that's very important. So that's the starting point of factorization. So the first thing I'm going to do, is it possible I can separate the physics at different scale by linked by onshore particle? Well, I guess start with example we, start, we talked in the last lecture, E plus minus two hadron. Now in this case, instead of all the hadron, all the jets, I'm going to look for one hadron. So what you see is I have a diagram goes through produce a, a, say a particle, say quark. Then the quark goes through some non-perturbative physics, end up with a hadron you observe. Imagine this is the wall of the diagram. Then you notice that this parton, say quarks or gluon, whatever it is, in the QCD, because you never see them. You have to integrate over the K all the D4K, so this parton quarks the gluon all was offshore. They never onshore in a scattering amplitude. So the well, that's the bad the way the way offshore. That means uh, these two will be connected by gauge. If you do the gauge transformation of particle, it's related to the all connected gauge transformation. Another concept of the cut diagram. Cut diagram means is the square of the amplitude. Imagine this is a square, scattering amplitude. This is a complex conjugate amplitude. We put the cut line between so that all the quantum number at this line, the left, right are the same. So in this picture, say, suppose this is a diagram, I try to calculate perturbatively. What will happen? Whenever you have a square of the diagram with the unobserved gluons, say, I, I simplified it, I somehow put it upside down, does no matter. So this is a particle, radial gluon go to final state, they end up with some kind of hard collision. I square the amplitude, there's a cut. So I have to integrate over the, all the possible momentum of this gluon since I never observed them. If I do that, imagine I write this amp amplitude as an integral over D4K. Th that's all the phase space. Then I have this thing I call T. I don't know what the function, certainly function of the P minus K and a hard scale Q. I have a two propagator, P minus K squared plus I epsilon in the amplitude. Complex conjugated is a P minus K squared minus I epsilon. Integral D4K, if it's on shell, final state particle, I have delta function. So that's a very generic expression. Suppose I make a simple variable change. Say P minus K, I call the variable L. So this is a proportional DL square with a bunch of other, other integral, since it's a proportional, what that tell you? 
if I look at this part alone perturbatively, this whole thing is infinity. Because if I integral the phase space of KL square, I have a pole, right, L squared equal to zero, and the upper half plane as well as the pole at L squared equal to zero at the lower half plane. If I deform the contour, say this way, I find L squared equal to zero, I substitute the other one, get infinity. If I deform the contour in the lower half plane, I will substitute in the upper half and get infinity. This divergence is known as pinch singularity. That means this part, of, if we integral the phase space, this whole integration perturbatively is dominated by the region L squared goes to zero. But non perturbatively, you know the cross action not go to infinity, then this uh, L squared never exactly equal to zero. There is some non perturbative physics from this uh, uh, part. But if you calculate perturbative diagram, then exactly true that if this is half part, you will have. This kind of pinch singularities. What the pinch singularity tells you, this is actually the foundation, all the proof of factorization. That was the reason, a major contribution by George Sturman. So he and Al Mueller share that's a cruel price for the factorizations. Because you know, when you have all order diagram, you have any particle floating around, you have infinite momentum fraction moving around. How can you organize in terms of the pinch structure that you can factorize them? So then this is the problem, but that's an event also good things. Remember we say, if we want to separate the physics happen here and physics happen here, we'd like to have them linked by the particle almost a mesh Yet yeah, this is actually the possibility because although they are offshore when I integral phase space, they dominate by the region, the case where close to zero, that means the time take between the interactions between happen here and here, is almost infinity. So you can imagine, you can calculate this part of the half scale Q, it's a perturbatively produce something on almost mass but of course they're never really mass show. In virtuality will be integrated into this part. So you have a factorization. So linked by onshore particle. So that was a based on really the pinch singularities, but that's one particle. If you have a multiple particle involved, you have that, you have a pinch surface because uh, the momentum can be moving around. So that's the concept you hear a lot from the rest of it. So now I give you a more detailed example, how to make that happen. Well, there were last slides with the physics that could be possible. Then how you derive the formula really connect to the factorization with the formula you have been using. Well, let's start with this scary amplitude, E plus minus to a single hadron. You integral the phase space D4K I call this part at the half scale, the Q, but also depend on K at the root S, that's a part, this part. Then also have a F represent this part, then plus all the high order corrections. So start with, because this integral is dominated by the region or the K square close to zero. So if I look at this bottom part, because there is a half scale sitting there, Q. So I can neglect the case virtual, the case square, I set the case square in the half part to be on shore, to be up as approximation. So K half square is zero because the Q is so large compared to K square, effective K square. So the correction from taking this approximation is a case, typical value of K square over the Q square. So that's a power correction. If I make this approximation, that means that all the virtuality of the K square can be integrated into this part because this part no longer depend on K square because K square compared to Q square is so much smaller. That's known as onshore approximation. That gave our reason eventually hear a lot from uh, Ian Stuhl make a TMD factorization work because once the pair separate by onshore particle, but we don't have to assume part of the collinear well, they can have transverse momentum. As long as they are on shell, they are separated by long distance. So next approximation, I will spend more time in my lecture, is known as you heard a lot about collinear factorization. Collinear factorization is the additional assumption. So the Eon talk will concentrate on onshore factorization because including both collinear and transverse separation. In this case, if I make a further approximation, 
So the transverse momentum of the caper is also much less than Q. So my H can be assumed the momentum of the K parallel to P is collinear. Then the rest of the momentum can be integrated over here. To achieve that, introduce a one, a delta function to the Z is the momentum fraction of the larger component of the observed one and the K. So I keep the, this uh, substitute into here. The convolution between the, this part of the diagram and this part of the diagram only through this momentum fraction. In that case, I can call this part as a platonic cross section produce a parton of momentum on shelf and collinear to the observed momentum. Rest of them, the parton never on shelf. You integral over there, it's a virtuality D4K, where that's the larger momentum component is a fraction of the observed momentum, multiply whatever the non-perturbed physics. Here, we, this function called the fermentation function for the parton to become the hadron. Then all the correction and neglect here will be k square over the q square and kt square because I made a collinear approximation, kt square over k square. So if I can neglect this power correction suppressed by one over q square, I have a formula for this cross section written as something I can calculate perturbatory to produce onshore parton, multiply the probability for the parton to go to hydron. Then the, with the correction control as a power correction. So you can see from a simple example, it is possible, but that's only one loop, right? One, one order. What happened to all order? That needs to be proved. So what are we going to do is that next is say, suppose that we can do that, but you know what the, for theory, keyword the predictive power. We prove this fact by formula, but this formula has no predictable power. At, at least for today's evolution, we can talk later. Because if I measure this cross section, I claim I can calculate this, I can extract this fermentation functions. I don't have a prediction. If someone came, say I calculate this as a function of whatever the scale, say I have I make a life simpler. This is the experiment measure. It's a number. It's a cross section. So I measure six. It's a number. When theorists come, say I calculate this, it's a three. So I extracted the function as a two. Another theorist come, no, 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 I don't believe your calculation. I calculate this number as a two. So I extract the D the three. So there's no predictive power. Even though we have a reason to believe this formula is true, I can expand it in terms of power correction. But what's the predictive power? That means you have to have more than what observable, which will be related to same non perturbative quantity, but with different coefficient you can calculate. Then the universality of those non perturbative quantity gave you the prediction. So if you have observable in one measurement, you measure two, or someone say three. But look for another observable relate to the exact same non perturbative quantity. I can calculate that coefficient function, then compare with the experiment. Then if you give me a two or three, my prediction for the experiment measure will be different. So experiment can do the experiment to test the prediction. So that's a predictive power of QCD factorization. You need to prove leading power non perturbative quantity have to be universal. Not only you can calculate this uh, short distance hot part order by order. So then we have to look for the additional observable. Typical observable with one hadron is now imagine you have a lepton scatter one hadron through the hot part, just like a Rutherford experiment, only observe the scale lepton. So in that case, I have a distribution, but this is not the same as the final state. So it is a distribution. You find the part on a quark within the hadron. You have a probability function, but this function is no guarantee to be same as you find a hadron within the part on. It's good you have another observable can be factorized, but you still don't have a predictive power. Well, that could be the third one. 
So the one is known as semi encode DIS. Suppose I go ahead to do the experiment to measure this uh, lepton hydron scattering with scattered lepton, in addition, measure a hydron in the final state. If I can prove factorization, because you can see there's a pinch singularity here, there's a pinch singularity here. If I can factorize them, then this will be related to this guy, this will be related to this guy. Imagine you can extract this from this experiment, extract this from this experiment. I can make a prediction of this experiment measurement so that I can test my theory. Okay, so that's a quick summary how the factorization works. Now I give you the exact example. So I'll start with the lepton hydron scattering, simple one, because we start with that. That's the experiment gave you the predict the discovery of the quarks inside the hydron led to the Nobel Prize. Then in that case, look at the DIS, you only measure leptons. So in that case, you have a scattering, the lepton here, the hydronic part from the Feynman diagram representation, you not only have one diagram, I show you. So if I square the amplitude, you have this diagram, you K and a K, you have a pinch singularity. What if I have next diagram like this? Well, this has a pinch singularity, this has a pinch singularity. What happened to this diagram? There is no clear pinch singularity because there's one loop here, one loop there. What happened? How can you prove these factorization beyond the leading order? So as I gave you the result, it took a long time, took effort. It is true, we can prove that. This whole scaring process, DIS, you can reduce to something you can control, you can show this in hard part. The probability to find a proton within the hadron, you square them, that's the amplitude complex conjugate, gave you quantum probability to find a proton within hadron, gave you structure information, then you have a power corrections. That power correction is exactly color entanglement between the, this part and this part, but they are suppressed by power. So this is a formula we can demonstrate to you, then this will work. So, so start with the simple, like a e plus minus case. In this case, I have a lowest order scaring amplitude electron on the hydron. I know how the electron interact with the photon by a vertex. I have a photon propagator. Now photon interact with the hydron, but it's a non perturbative So I put in the, this a general broad. In terms of field theory, even though I don't know this, but I can formally write this part as a U bar, go backwards. Then you have vertex and a U, the spinner. Then the propagator, if I do the Feynman gauge, then I have this part, the matrix element, a final state, every single particle with a sum X. Then with the electromagnetic current, the photon interact with this. Then with the initial state P and a sigma, sigma is spin. So that's the formula you can write that. So what about cross section? I can write a cross section as a square, cross section proportional to amplitude square with the average over the initial spin, if I do spin average, then the flux factor, then the phase space, all the number of particles in the final state can be any number, then the energy momentum conservations. It seems hopeless, too, too hard because we don't know this. Well, we can take advantage of knowledge we already have. Say so this one, if I square, I can write this, this simple form, the L mimic corresponding to QED part, the square of this one. No matter how complicated it is, but it's a leading order case, it's just a square of this diagram. I can write down the, the L mu, mu in terms of this form. Then there's a hydronic part, no matter how complicated it is, I can write, oops. Sorry, dude. I can write a square in terms of the two current, then the correlator between the two states, I use a spin now instead of sigma, sorry for the confusion. The integral of the, all the, cor the distance correlation between Fourier chance to momentum space do the momentum chance for the cube. Although I don't know this, this depends on the QCD, but this formula I had early, this decomposition does not depend on QCD. Only take advantage of, of the QED exchange, one photon exchange. So with this, I know the QCD assume parity is invariant, as we believe, and all time reversal is invariant, and also believe that electromagnetic current is conserved. With that in your mind, I immediately derive, no matter how complicated this function is, you can convince you can have 
four pencil structures. Because this function depends on two momentum you observe, P and a Q plus a spin. In that case, you can have a two spin average structure. This one, both current conserved, and a spin dependent structure, which also current conserved. So at the end of the day, without knowing the detail of the QCD for this one, you know this amplitude can be represented by four scalar functions. Two of them relate to spin average, two of them relate to spin dependent. So, so far have no QCD detail is being used. So now let's look at the QCW. What if we're going to try to use our knowledge of a QCD? So how much we can learn from that? The example I told you, W mu mu given the, this diagram representation, you have a lowest order diagram, high order diagram, many of them. I told you the perturbative pinch singularity, if you integral over these, that you can immediately see area, the integration of dk squared is dominated by the region of phase space when the, this part is a factory on shell. So way to make approximation like I did for e plus minus, this is an example I told you the K, I can always decompose into the component of collinear to the larger momentum and the momentum conjugate the larger momentum and the transverse momentum. This expression decomposition is exact, depend on the KT, depend on momentum fraction. So I can decompose this expression in terms of this DX DKT, then neglect the virtuality k square inside hot part because q square is so much larger. Then the rest exclude all the rest of potential perturbative pinch singularity with the rest of it, but non-perturbatively, this is just a function, a non-perturbative quantity. I cannot calculate in perturbation theory, but in principle, I try to extract it from the experiment. The correction for me to do this is suppressed by the one over q square. So this is exactly what I did for the e plus minus. But I do the same for the lepton hydron scattering. And also, you know, this uh, separation between them is the key is k square on shell. So the convolution between them, the connection between these two involving both the longitudinal momentum and transverse momentum, this is actually the basis for the TMD factorization. But for my lectures, I make life simpler. I make a further approximation, say that the k per is also small compared to q. If that's the case, I can make approximation, further approximation from this diagram. You know, the final state delta function can be written in terms of a delta function in the momentum fraction. Then this is the amplitude diagram. You can see I have literally every single step here, I have D4K. I have this platonic part from the top, this part of the diagram given here. I have a spinner index IJ, final state delta function, then multiply the Fourier transform this matrix sum into the position space corresponding to field has a spinner index i and j. So this is the exact expression for this diagram plus the high order diagrams. Now I'm going to make an approximation. So the first approximation, what I'm going to make is that I group first the group this part as H, this part as F. So what I'm going to do to make approximation is that the K inside these to be Collinear. Only, and that means the correction will be k square over kt over q. So I neglect that as a power correction. So when I do that, I can introduce a delta function like I did it before. So convolution over the x, then the x delta function part into the, the part of the non perturbative part. So this part, I separate the momentum, but it's still connected by spin because you can see the spin of this is traced through the matrix element. So I have to separate the spin. So leading contribution of that, there is a gamma dot XP. There's a pattern on show, act like the U bar U, sum of the spin. So that's approximation. Then I multiply the corresponding, the normalization factor for this conjugate to projection operator equal one. So I operate the spin. Now spin trace, this part of taking care as a scattering, this pattern is on show with some of the u, u bar over the spin, give you half gamma xp, then rest of them into this non perturbative matrix element. So when I do that, I can call this first part, I can calculate, that's exactly the w mu mu as the hat, a short distance, multiply this function, I call the distribution functions, 
with the power correction, then if you yeah, translate into the picture, this is the lowest order diagram corresponding to this guy, then have power correction, then a convolution corresponding to dx over x, then the rest of them define uh, the dis probability distribution to find the quark in this case inside hydro. If I look at the definition corresponding to a QQ bar contracted with the projection operator and the momentum constant integral of the momentum, but this distribution is divergent, you have to have a UV counter term to renormalize it. So then you can see this factorization formula is exactly like a parton picture we talk about it, have elastic scaring because it's unsure parton from the lepton, multiply the probability to find them. So this is the formula that at the same time, you know what the approximation you make. You made this kind of approximation, neglect this part for the power correction, and also spin part, you only kept the gamma XP. You have additional spin component. Those spin component can be also power suppressed. So then what's about distribution? Distribution is defined in terms of operator, the side by side. Remember there's a, a, the operator at Fourier transfer into the position space. That's a simple expression. But this definition, uh, this notation is from my previous slide, is a phi, but in the, in the handbook you use F, but they are same thing. But uh, you will find that this is not gauge event. If I make a gauge transformation, I told you early, the fermion and the gluon, if I make the gauge transformation, this is not the invariant. So if I claim, if I do the measurement, this is a part of the cross section. If I claim this, I can calculate, I can extract this one, but if this one is not gauge invariant, you know, everything you can physically observe has to be gauge invariant. Something's wrong. Well, theory take care of themselves, nothing is wrong because we only missed it. We didn't include everything at this order. So what happened is that we need a gauge link. Now in the sense of this link between these two fields, when you apply the gauge transformation, this quantity become uh, invariant and also UV renormalization. So in terms of diagram, in the sense you have the projection, you know, required plus momentum to be X, momentum fraction, the integral full momentum, this is notation is for gauge link, but it's a word. I'm gonna show you where they come from. Okay, I just cannot tell you words, right? You have to, in order to believe me, you want to see what happened. Well, I gave you this order. Remember this diagram I mentioned. For the lowest order, I did not include it. But if I imagine I go to the next order, the gluon, of course, I have a Lorentz next to mu. So suppose I take a part of it, that this gluon is longitudinally polarized. Then if I calculate this left diagram, you will find that if we fully transform position space, this A, the field here is A, where we fully transfer in position space, then you have M represent this, uh, uh, this part of interaction. And look at the detail of this part. If I look at this part, there's a propagator. The, there's a loop of momentum XI have to integrate over. The propagator you will find then can, be have a, can have a pole, have a divergence. But this divergence is not pinched in the sense I have an app, so I can deform a contour to uh, take the, this integration like I given here. So in fact, when XI loop when it goes to zero, then this integration, I can close it, but I have the requirement in order to be, allow me to close, I add the constraint on the integration. So then what happened is the constraint to have this to be in conserved integration, you end up with IG coupling constant from here, the integration of the y, this position is from a y minus where this point is to the infinity of the final state. Multiply and the n, the m is the rest of the lowest order diagram. So this left-hand side diagram can be approximated at this. Then if I do the right-hand side diagram together, I can approximate the exact same thing, but with different constraints, because this diagram constraints from inf zero to infinity, and the opposite sign, then M again is the lowest order diagram. So when I combine these two together, this diagram, I will get a minus IG, have phase space integral, one is a zero to infinity, another Y minus infinity, multiply that. That's nothing but the order of G term of the gauge link. This is, if you expand this to the first term is the one, that's this guy, to the first order term is exactly what I derived. 
Our next slide. Oh, sorry. I, that's this term. I gave you homework. Then I said, okay, I'm going to add any number of gluon and any number of cut as long as the gluon is longitudinally polarized. You sum them together, you get nothing but the full gauge length. So that means that the high order diagram, not necessarily small. Some of them can give you leading power contribution. So this is exactly very important when you apply a factorization. Once you combine that, you get a gauge inverse. So now they say, okay, I deal with those diagrams. But you say, you also told me there is this diagram. You have a pinch singularity here, the pinch singularity here, high order diagram. So now suppose I integral over this momentum from zero to whatever hydronic scale you probe here. So you know this, if the k is one go to zero, that's p, that's divergent. Then I cannot calculate. Then that means the time between here and here is go to infinity. How can I'm gonna handle this diagram? Well, within the factorization, like the example I gave to you at the beginning, I'm going to the, um, reorganize, you know, the ultraviolet renormalization, I reorganize my perturbation theory in terms the short distance and the long distance. Here, the collinear, because they're coming from the region, the collinear region. So again, I organize this in terms of the integral, say zero to some scale mu. Then this can give me divergence. Then also from mu to some half scale probe, this does not give me divergence. So this, I can approximate the first part as a low order diagram because they have a divergent point. Inch. So I put this one into rest of the diagram. So I have a low store diagram convolute the integral of this rest of the diagram. Then this is actually the first order of a distribution. This is a coefficient function. Then this diagram, because this has no pinch, so pinch coming from here. So I'm going to separate this part as my C1, then rest of them a distribution. So you can see that for every diagram, I can organize in such a way that some part of the short distance, some of the long distance, but I have to combine them together. By doing so, I gave you the result. If anyone's interested, we can go through the detail. So you will find that that's a, suppose that to take a physical gauge, everything dominated by sort of a ladder diagram. You have a pinch everywhere. Every pair is pinched. But with the organization I told you early, you can organize in such a way, all the short distance, you can collect in here in the power steel RFS with no divergence. Then the rest of them included in the correction to the distributions. So that means a physical observed quantity like a structure function can be expressed as a short distance power you can calculate, convolute at distribution functions and with the power collections. So this is a general factorization formula, but I, I have not really proved to order, but I demonstrate how that work could work. The proof, of course, a little bit more involved. What happened? Yeah, you guys scroll back on the curve. Who's the curve? Who's the curve of that? Doesn't move. Oh, okay. No. Right clicking. Right clicking. I think that's what you're doing. Uh, I need your help. This is, you see, I'm a Mac person. I really don't know how this works. Sorry about it. So then, oh, sorry, I didn't click this one. Someone remind me the time. I forgot to stop this one, but I will try to make sure that on time again. And so what happened in the separation between these, if we prove, no, we have, well, I didn't get a detailed proof yet. I can be done, but here I just gave intuitively how this works. Then once you have this quantity, but you say it depends on the scale you choose, just the renormalization, you have an arbitrary scale, to separate this, where the perturbity one and non perturbity one, the physics observed quantity should not depend on the choice that scale, just like a renormalization. So easily you can prove that they are derived the renormalization scale. But before I do that, I gave you a physics intuition. What does that formula mean? If I have a cross section, have an electron scattered with a proton, Proton is coming at a long distance. They have a lot of interaction here. But the hard collision takes a time zero now because the time scale is so short 
compared to all the activity here, the past and the future, they end up with the jet fixtures, the final state. So there is a long lead proton state I mentioned they can be effectively pinched. When I squared them, your individual final state, like an E plus minus total cross section, there are lots of the like the general structure, you cannot capture them. But when I square them, you will find that unitarity, once I produce a proton, they all become the hadron. So the unitarity tell you this square of the amplitude, the lepton hadron scary, can be a factor factor the short distance part or the one over Q, multiply a long distance part, we eventually call the distribution function. Then, so that's the, how the factorization work at all order. So then I'm going to show you then, uh, as I mentioned, the choice of the scale is arbitrary. If now that's a formula I have. So then the question is, can you, how can we calculate this quantity? As I say, you have a measurable unknown functions. How can you calculate this? You get me physical argument. There is a short distance. How can you calculate this systematically? And so the yes, there is a systematic way to calculate based on the, a concept. Factorization, if you prove, does not depend on long distance physics. You only show the short distance physics can be universe, uniquely factorized from the long distance physics. The long distance physics can be a proton, can be a neutron, can be a pion, but short distance dynamics you factor out only depend on observable, the lepton scattering, they should be the same. I push that to the limit. So long distance physics can be asymptotic apart from a quark. This factorization is still true, but the difference is the long distance now, if you imagine you put the hydron to the quark, everything now becomes a Feynman diagram because uh, you know, the quark is an asymptotic state. So this F2, not on the hydron, the quark, this is a Feynman represented by a Feynman diagram. Then this distribution within the quark represents a Feynman diagram. But they both divergent. And they say, you know, when you put the asteroid quark has no mass, there's a collinear divergence. So what happened is put the regulator. So once you put the apply the factorization formula to the platonic state, introduce the regulator, the divergence of the control in this case is not the ultraviolet divergence, rather the collinear and the infrared divergence. Then you regularize it, then become a family that you can calculate these. Then if the factorization is true, divergent from left-hand side have to cancel the divergent from right-hand side. Leave this quantity infrared safe. So this is how we can actually calculate this coefficient function order by order in perturbation theory by applying the factorization theory of the hydron state to the proton state with the regularization. Okay, so now I'll give you a quick example. So then lowest order, we project factorize it. Then they expand both sides. This is the Feynman diagram in the power series of S. So you start with the dot light diagram is the lepton scale of the quark, only depends on electromagnetic coupling constant. So zeroth order in the QCD. So you write according to this formula, you have a C times the probability to find the quark without, within the quark without interaction. That's delta function. I will show you how to calculate. So if it is delta function, then you know the first order coefficient function is exactly, you calculate lowest order Feynman diagram for the lepton scale on the quark. That's like a proton model, right? Then the QCD is much richer than proton model. When you correct the next leading order, what happened, you have to put to the, expand both sides to the order of alpha s. You have a platonic structure function on the quark state to the order of alpha s. Right hand side to expand, you have to have a short distance part of the order of alpha s, then long distance part of zero, then the short distance part of zero, the long distance part of order of alpha s. This is what we want to calculate. So you write the C1 is nothing but the, this guy minus this thing. You know, I told you if you calculate this, this has divergence. Well, this subtraction is exactly give you the cancellation of the divergence. You leave at the end of the day, the coefficient function is finite. So you can repeat this step by step. You will find by applying your factorization formula in the hydronic state, 
on the platonic state could be cool, could be gluon. You effectively extract all the short distance coefficient functions all the, all the, by all the in a perturbation theory. So now, oh, what happened? Okay, sorry. So then, then first, let me give you an example how this uh, distribution within the quark says that I have a distribution, general definition you had before, KG link to field. So I replace this hydronic state by a, a platonic state. So this will be given by a Feynman diagram. So I, it's divergent, but if I render it, I can calculate. Start with the lowest order. It's the lowest order, nothing, just diagram the quark to quark, no interaction. So I strictly follow this uh, definition, have a, this incoming quark half gamma p spin average. Then the vertex is a projection operator defined this distribution. The delta function coming from the, in the momentum space definition of PDF, phase space, you get a result of delta x minus one. That's uh, say it, it's a natural. If we have no interaction, probability to find a quark within quark is one. Or probability density is delta function. So now what about first order? I gave you the different approach how to calculate, but first I gave you the result. If I calculate this, you will find the integral of dkt over kt. I didn't, I didn't suppose that is in four dimension in the Feynman diagram, you will find divergence. When the k square go to zero, you have a divergence, that's collinear divergence. When k square go to infinity, you have ultraviolet divergence. So you have to have a UV counter term to re remove the ultraviolet divergence. So the pattern like distribution, pattern within pattern distribution, depend on the renormalization. That's exactly known as a scheme dependence, depending on how you choose the scheme, and also depend on the regulator for the collinear divergence. So then we have to introduce a regulator, right? So I will use dimension regulation later. So start with a complete example, lepton DIS. What you have is W mu mu. You can put it into the structure function F1, F2 to spin average. So normally in the four dimension, you can say, oh, I can project to both sides. I can write an F1, F2 in term W mu mu with a projection operator. So if I interest on F2, so I calculate w, whatever Feynman diagram for W mu mu with this projection operator. That's in the fixed dimension, four dimension. What if I have to go to regulator? So that's different. So the imagine, so lowest order to complete that, I show there is no divergence. So I follow the rule, exactly I calculate F2 cube is given here is a delta function with X1. C0 is nothing but E fractional square X time delta X1. So if I do the n dimension, if I do C1, this different because this has divergent. I have to regularize them. If I introduce dimension regularization, immediately a caution had to be made is that the projection operator you given in the four dimension is no longer true because when you go to n dimension, if I extract F2, there is epsilon depend on dimension because the dimension is not the equal to four anymore. So in that case, when you extract F2, you have to make sure you don't lose those epsilon dependence. Those epsilon dependence are very, very important to help you to cancel the divergence. So now suppose I do the inclusive real diagram. These are the diagram with a cut, all the radius of grew up, and the virtual diagram. So I have to calculate to get a projection, I have to calculate contraction G mu mu on this diagram, and a contraction P mu P mu on this diagram. Then I eventually get F1 the F2 after the first order. I can calculate, as I said, lowest order I given here is the n dimension, zero order, dependent epsilon now. Then the first order I can calculate into this form for virtual diagram, delta function equal to one. That's a virtual diagram, just like the lowest order, except the correction is epsilon dependent. It's divergent if epsilon go to zero. Then to the next real diagram, you have some X dependence and a power divergence. Then this is a technical detail I'm going to skip. Then if anyone interested, we can talk afterwards. Then the question is how are we going to expand epsilon go to zero? So one thing is that, that typically one over one minus x, one plus epsilon, you expand it, you have a delta function term, but also the so-called plus distribution. What that means? Means that you define for any function, test function, multiply one minus x plus is actually define the convolution of fx minus fx equal to one. So this definition means when x goes to one, the divergent is canceled. 
plus if we use this z, so there's some logarithm the finite piece. So now with that in your S node, you know how to do the expansion. You work it out, you will find the one loop expansion, the real diagram. You will find a Jimmy Mu part, contract the Jimmy Mu part. You will have all the infrared divergent cancer with some of finite pieces depending on X, except the piece proportional to that splitting function actually coming from the collinear divergence. So that divergence is required to be canceled by subtraction term. So then also you can calculate the P mu P mu term, we find this term vanish. Then the for a virtual diagram, you have to include the P mu P mu, the virtual di a real diagram, you get a, some finite piece contribution. You combine all together, you have F2Q at the first order, everything seems to be perfectly fine, except you have a one over epsilon. But remember when you calculate a real diagram, you have a one over epsilon square. One over epsilon square corresponding divergence, you have a both collinear infrared divergence. But if you're including a complete set of diagram, infrared divergence will cancel. So at the end of the day, only thing left is a collinear divergence. So that's a collinear divergence from F1. Then what about the subtraction term? Remember that the, the coefficient function equal to the structural function you calculate minus the low order coefficient function times the distribution, find a quark within the quark. So the distribution function we calculate early is proportional that there is an integral of dk per over k per that have a both ultraviolet divergence and collinear divergence. So I do the dimensional regularization. I use the one dimensional regularization to regularize both divergence. So what you will find uh, there is a piece from a UV divergence, that piece by collinear divergence. So I introduce the UV counter term to take away the UV divergence. So it's this divergence I would need to cancel this guy. So what you have here now, there is ambiguity, depending on how you choose the UV counter term. Oh, geez. So then there's a many scheme you heard in the uh, literature, MS screen, scheme. What that means, I choose the UV counter term exactly equal to divergent piece. Or I MS bar screen, I choose the divergent part is this part with some constant, like the Euler constant, which is universal. Then uh, another known, probably less known, the DIS scheme, I choose the C1Q equal to zero, just my choice. So then when you combine the two together, I take MS bar scheme. So you know, coefficient function is this a platonic structure function F2 minus zeroth order convoluted distribution, both of them collinear divergent. But when you combine them together, they exactly cancel the divergent, everything is finite. So that's a complete example for identifying the hydrogen, the calculation, the short distance coefficient with one identified hydrogen. So now, as I said earlier, the physical cross section F2, depending on what you claim, you can calculate something unknown. This right hand side depends on factorization scale. Left hand side is the physically extract from the data, does not depend on factorization scale. So the full derivative has to be equal to zero. Same as E plus minus hydrogen total cross section. You take the full derivative equal to zero, derive the renormalization group equation for the alpha S. Here, you take a derivative equal to zero, you immediately realize you take a derivative of the first term, take a derivative of the second term, then you derive a very famous equation, E plus and minus to have your total cross section, you learn coupling constant of a strong traction, depend on scale you probe them. In this case, you find that you derive equation, now combine this together, you tell us you, the distribution function depend on scale you probe that. So that's exactly the decalibrate evolution equations. How the distribution function evolve depend on the scale you probe that. So that you can see the renormalization group equation in fact tells you the quantity you extract from physical observable depend on scale of the momentum you, no, you, you probe them. Oh no, gosh, sorry. So that's a one hydrogen. So now I give you another quick example, how you calculate this, is a, how you derive the DGLAB evolution equation, give you some physics intuition related to something else. So remember what the this definition of the operator for distribution, like a, you find a quick bar within the proton state. 
you calculate the evolution means I change the scale to probe them. Then we look at the diagram with the radiation. So you can have a real diagram and virtual diagram. So you can do the calculation like instead of you jumping to dimensional regulation in each, in, from the beginning. You end up with something expressed in one of epsilon square, one of epsilon. You put them together, you epsilon cancel, you get to the splitting function, then the square term. Well, you don't have to do that. You actually know the physics. You can do the calculation, use the water entity, you will find this virtual diagram. You know they cancel diverging when x goes to one and when the gluon radiation momentum goes to zero. This diagram can be related to actual diagram exactly the same as the first one. So they can retain in such a way that variation of the distribution equal to the increased number of distribution due to the radiation from a high momentum pattern. Or minus a lose, you lost some probability to find distribution from part of original have that momentum, but because the radiation, the part end up with a different momentum. So you have to integrate over that. So then that's exact loss term. So this is nothing is like a Boltzmann equation. So then in the sense of the, because the fundamental interaction vertex is the same, the same in the QCD. So then you will end up with the change of distribution is always equal to the gain part and the loss part. This is for the core, but also apply core ground combination. So you give a very clear intuition for the probability interpretation of that. So that's for one hydro, very good. But we like to do, there is no predictive power if you have one hydro, it depends on a single universal function you can call distribution function or PDF. You ought to have a test, just like a Feynman proposed the Potter model in early days, there is no predictive power. In this, you predict there is a scaling issues, but you cannot predict absolute variable distributions. So come to the observable with the two hadrons. So I will concentrate on the, from the one hadron to the two hadron. This is the formula with that one hadron. They you know, do this measurement, you calculate this, you extract this, then what's the predictive power? So that led to the observable with two hadron known as Joyan process, the process was proposed before the QCD. So the idea is that I want to test the universality of the distribution. So the idea is that you have a two hadron collide, you have a short distance, the cucumber aneration go to say E plus minus. Then you have a probability to find a one quark from one hadron, probability to find the anti quark from another hadron. So cucumber aneration with the power correction. So that was a predict proposed that observable took more than 20 years for theories to prove the factorization. The difficulty is that you can have a soft interaction between the two hydrons. I said earlier, you can have a short distance part, you have a one hydron, the physics taking place at a different scale, all the soft interaction, quantum interference between them is the power suppressed. But now you have two hadrons. You do have a short distance. In then you can solve the interaction between these two. There is no hard scale. They have the same scale. So if the soft interaction is important, you lose the universality. Before the hard collision taking place, this soft interaction can change the distribution of the one hadron to something else, right? It's no longer universal. So it is that part took 20 years for people to prove it. For theories work very hard. I tell you the why, and also I have a four, three slide to show you the key step to prove that. So let's start with something the formula originally proposed by Jordan Yang. Say you have a hydron hydron alliteration if the quark and tight quark goes to join Yang pair with large invariant mass. So you naturally say square of the amplitude approximates the square of this probability to find one times square of this probability to find another one multiply the whatever QQ by narration to the lepton pair. So in that case, you can write down the formula in the part-time pictures, the invariant, the cross-section can be proportional to short distance collision, multiply the convolution of two, two distribution. Then when you calculate short distance collision, there's some delta functions to fix the momentum fraction, just like the DIS case. So you have this expression as a prediction because the proposal was before the QCD. 
there is no color factor. If you include it, there is a warm and see the color factor at the leading order in QCD. But that time, it, since this proposal in 1970, before the QCD was invented, so then they looked at this expression, compared with data, magically, the shape is more or less, is almost consistent, except normalizations. So then of normalization, there is a color part, even including the color part, there is a K fact roughly about two. So there is a disagreement between normalization, but shape is close. So that's really the one critical test for years. They think this picture, platonic picture is valid. But the question I mentioned to you, how can you prove that this picture is true? Because you can easily have a soft interaction between them. You can change this to distributions. This is not the soft interaction between short distance and long distance. It's a soft interaction between the long distance. You can break the universalities. So then there is an intuitive argument I gave to you. You can easily verify. So what the soft interaction? There is a gluon vector particle. If you imagine your observer, you stay one hydrogen. Another hydrogen come in very, very fast. Then the gluon field is just like a vector field. You have to, Lorentz, they're moving very, very fast. They are Lorentz contracted. They realize that the gluon field, just like a photon vector field, you have a longitudinal component as well as the transverse component. If you look at the longitudinal component, then, then you will find they never Lorentz contracted. Before the two hadron interact, short distance, they actually you feel the gluon coming from the hadron at no time. But luckily, the gluon level Lorentz contracted is a longitudinal prize, which gauge dependent. So physical observable is gauge invariant. You will show eventually those are strongly suppressed. They can be either unitary to take care of them or can be removed. So now if you look at physically polarized, like if you're in a QED, like E field and a B field, you can do the same thing for QCD. You will find this field actually not only the Lorentz contracted, and the wall of a gamma, like a ruler is a wall of a gamma Lorentz contracted, is a wall of a gamma square. So that actually gave us a chance to show not only the leading power factorization is true, even at the next leading power factorization is true, then anything beyond the factorization plate. So the Julian cross section as a whole is not factorizable completely, but the leading power in over Q expansion is factorizable. If it's a spin average, more of a Q squared correction, is also factorizable in terms of universal distributions. Then if it's a polarized one, you will find one over Q is factorized. But anything beyond that is not factorizable. You say, oh, it's not factorized, it's bad. Well, as long as they can show those are small, you still have predicting power. So that's the conclusion. Now I gave you the reason why it took people so long. So let's look at the simplest diagram, Joyam is really a QQ bar generation with the distributions. Then you, you certainly have a very fundamental things help you the pinch singularity between this pair and between this pair. So then you will have a chance to the short distance part will be connected with long distance by onshore pattern. So those are good. So you can see the lowest order, you can easily immediately say you can maintain the universality of PDF if there is a separate by onshore pattern, same thing here. Then the, the, then the problem, then this is the kinematical region. If the invariant mass is so much smaller compared to half part, so you do factorize this, factorize that, but probably the soft interaction between them. So this will come to the contribution and George Sturman show, you can organize all the long distance contribution, the soft interaction into three categories. One is known as a, Hot part, they show distance hiding inside the, this blue one. Another one is the collinear, as well as the divergent, right? When the blue one is the collinear to this guy, they give you leading power contributions. And also another part is the soft. They are very soft. They can connect it between two hydron state. But if you have this as a leading contribution, it does not have factorization formula because you have distribution, but they all connect it with soft interactions. So what the factorization proof need to do? They need to show all these collinear interaction can be reduced to something into the universal distribution. 
and a soft interaction can be effectively removed or convert to something universal. You can manage that. So that's a proof. Then also I'll tell you what's the difficulty behind the proof. So start with, you will find the leading power of the gluon, collinear gluon, actually the longitudinal gluon, which exactly consistent what we say, that the gluon, the polarization proportional is the momentum. So water and energy, you can apply the water energy when the gluon flow into the pot is equivalent, if the water energy tells you, you sum over the order connection equal to zero. So end up with the connector initial line, so gauge the gauge link. So longitudinal gluon collinear can be taken care of by water entity end up with a gauge link. But the difficult part is the soft gluon, they can interact between the hydron, they can change things. How that happened, that why it took over 20 years to prove this part is known as a so-called global region. You can imagine the gluon like this. The gluon connect this can be by deformer contour, you can factorize into the gauge link, it's easy. The trouble is this guy. Imagine you have a spectrum, they have a gluon exchange because here I put the final state. So momentum final state means the fix. So this momentum have to flow through this initial one coming back here. They immediately realize you have a propagator from here. You have a propagator here, depend on the K. Then you will find work it out, corresponding to propagator. Then this, if you take the limit, you will see this is the K minus in the minus component plus epsilon, the limit of the K minus minus epsilon. That's exactly pinch singularity. So you can pinch the momentum to be zero. So then you end up with, it. you could not deform, you get a divergence. So soft gluon exchange between spectator B and an active part on A can, in a sense, this guy's rotated color, but you can deform that. But the trouble with this group, global region, you make a plus minus component, the transverse momentum becomes less bigger than the transverse component of this gluon can resolve the detail of the hydron, you break the factorization. That took 20 years to prove it. This global region can be taken care of it by the inclusiveness of the observable. Because the, what you observe has no color. So by some of the, all the possible final state, you, you, know, you have a pole in the upper half plane, the pole in the lower half plane, you sum over the all final state, the unitary territory, then those pole canceled. So once you do that, you end up with a, a soft factor if the transverse separated, if you allow the transverse momentum. If it's a collinear case, then the transfer, this position, there is no transverse separation, the soft factor becomes equal to one. It's a unitarity, one. So this can be completely moved. End up with the formula, you end up with this gave you the distribution from one hydron. This gave you distribution from other hydron. Then this is the short distance hot pot. So this require you sum over the all the final state to cancel the pole from the one half plane. That pole, the other half plane no longer pinch, you can default. This, this is a Joyam two hydron case. So now this uh, actually you have a factorized formula if uh, they observe a single scale. So d sigma d four q, if the qt out of q I only have a single scale, no other collinear factorization that's related to equation TMD from book. And also if a qt the, the uh, much less than q, uh, this is a, uh, yeah, much less than q, then you have a power correction reduced to the TMD factorization mode, even Ian I'm going to tell you more about it. So I will skip. But about spin dependence, the leading power factorization does not depend on spin. So in the sense of the factorization formula will be same for the polarized one at the leading power. So now remember uh, that's two hydrogen can be factorized. What about three hydrogen? That's exactly what LHC doing. Have hydron, hydron collision produce another hydron or another jet. So remember I said that if there's a hydrogen go to final state, you want to prove that Cancellation global region might require the sum of the all the final state. But if you observe the one hydrogen in the final state, how can you prove the factorization? Even though every people use the form, this formula, if a two hydrogen correspond to distribution, short distance hop with the fragmentation functions. To my great surprise, when I tried to prove factorization for coconia production with George, we look over the literature, there is no proof. Everybody use the formula. So we did in our paper show the proof 
The idea is that you prove, it is true, this will break the saturation with soft interaction between these guys. The trick is that when you factorize the final part, there is no pink, you do the separation to the fermentation pool first. After you separate that, what soft in interaction between them is the power suppressed. You know exactly this formula is the only true when the PT is so much larger than any scale momentum scale you evolve. Then the soft interaction is the power suppressed. Then once you neglect that part, separate to the universal function, fermentation function, then the global gluon can be canceled again. You sum over the final state. So that's the reason you can prove the factorization at a single hyd three hydron case. So with all this now, okay, I gave you the summary not getting there. So I have a, at the end of the day, you need to extract this function tells you universal function, right? So what we do is that imagine I said you left on hydron, we have a short distance multiply distribution with some power correction. Then the experiment, you can also semi-inclusive, I didn't talk here, you have left on hydron with another hydron, your distribution of fermentation function if you integrate a PT. A hydron hydron case like LHC, you can have a PP goes to left on pair like joy -M. Joy -M is more than just left on pair. You can produce a virtual photon, you can produce W, Z, or Higgs, as long as they don't carry color. You can prove that factorization. So you have proportional two distribution with a short distance half power with a power correction. And E plus minus, you have a short distance with two fermentation functions. If you observe one hydron, it's one fermentation functions. So with this complete set, you can see that some unknown distribution, fermentation function, but if you have a sufficient number of observable, you can extract them from the experiment. So first test is consistency. Is it possible we can find a, a universal set of PDF and the fermentation functions? And so the yes. After many years efforts, we now will be able to do that. Idea is that you have a combined the theory and from a knowledge factorization to identify good observable, they factorize. Measurement to give you reliable data, experiment. Then global analysis means I took all this together to the analysis to extract this function because it's a convolution. It's the inverse problem. It's not that one multiply two or one plus two. It's a convolution. You have to do the unconvolution or the solve the mathematical language is the inverse problem. So you require a lot of effort. So then, but luckily we demonstrate QCD is still consistent in this region. So idea is you have all the data from a future EIC, Jefferson lab, KEK from E plus minus, Brookhaven, Hadron, Hadron, a pro even including Spring, Fermi lab, so this gave you the data. Then we know all the observable can be factorized some analytical CAC coefficient, with a content correlation function depend on PDF or fermentation function with a systematic error from theory being the power correct and neglect them. So with this in the mind, then what we do, we do the following. We do the, use the so far use the basic inference. The idea is that we do that even including AI machine learning, the new technology. You have some kind of try functions. They predict a theoretical prediction that compare with data, then minimizing eventually you get to the, what the best distributions. So you extract the distribution of fermentation from simultaneously. So what happened is we did it. So then we get to the distribution input. You can have some parameter. That's one approach, historical approach. But now that neural network, you say I have a neural net for this distribution without specific parameter or functional form. In that case, you have in some sense, the neural network is infinite number of parameters. But at the end of the day, you get a set of distributions, say quark distribution within the proton, have this up quark, down quark, and the gluon, but they have uncertainty because experiments have uncertainty, distribution you extract have uncertainty. But the key is, is it possible? This set of universal distribution or fermentation function can explain all the possible data in the world. The answer is yes. So there's some constraint, I skip that. So here is the DIS. Lepton hydron scattering from hell. You can vary the Q square by five order magnitude. You can vary the range of X, again, the four order magnitude from 10 to minus four to the one. You will find the theory and experiment is very consistent, not only as a function of Q square, as a function of X. So you can see the factorization formula actually works for this, but I want to probe even more the hydron hydron. LTC have a tremendous data. 
this slides a sort of a state of art. I have all these observables that have the kinematic coverage of data in terms of X and Q squared, huge range, the many order magnitude in the Q squared, many order magnitude in the X. Now you can fit the data. Remember when you fit data, you needed that coefficient function, you can calculate from theory. You have a leading order, next leading order. Now we can calculate next, next leading order in the two loop. So the idea is the cross section, physically observed and never depend on what your leading order, next leading order. Cross section, cross section, you measure. So what you see is that when you compare theory and experiment, if you do the chi-square fit, you will find that if you only include leading order formula, the chi-square is larger than one. Certainly it's a leading order is already pretty good. If you go to next leading order, so close to one, if you go to next, next leading order, you will find theory and experiment for larger range of kinematics is very, very consistent in these pictures. So I show you a so-called state of art proposal from the, uh, one of the, this, uh, I believe from Atlas colleagues, you have a measurement, have all the different observable in terms of cross section, how many order magnitude you can change from in terms of cross section, as a, then this is a cross section, cross section. It's from 10 to minus four, very rare event, to the 10 to 11. The, that's a really lot of events. You have almost a 15 order of the magnitude in terms of observable, in terms of cross section. Theory and experiment take the absolute data over the theory. You can see so consistent at sit at the one, except the couple of them with a cross section number is so low, have a much larger uncertainties. That tells you the electric weak theory standard model plus QCD and the P universal PDF works really to the precision. So now that's a collinear distribution. Remember as a factorization necessary condition, they have to link by onshore part time. The pattern can have longitudinal momentum and the transverse momentum, but we, if, the trans, if the momentum transfer is so large, at the larger scale, so much larger than the typical lambda QCD, which is the one we're affirming, so I can neglect transverse momentum, that's no, I end up with a collinear distribution. But that does not tell me full story of the hydron structure. Only tells me the probability to find a pattern inside hydron in the collision, does not tell me what's inside the proton, what's the confined motion of the proton inside proton wave function. Does not tell me how the coarse gluon distributed inside proton wave function. But those require the sensitivity at the one over Fermi. That's a scale at a 200 MeV. It's not perturbed to scale. So what happened is, what I say here is that, what can we do to be sensitive to the transverse motion is a KT is a much less than Q, or if you transfer the position much larger than the one, in the order of Fermi, but also much larger than one over Q. This is exactly related to TMD and eventual GPD, another one we are not talking much detail here, but the physics that you need a new class of observable. That class of observable I call the new type of hard probe. It's a physical observable with two scale. In the real world, we don't have part Quarks, gluons are just a field. Just like in QED, photon is a field. Depend on observable, photon show the particle nature like Einstein, you know, for the electric get a Nobel Prize. All photon can show as a wave. Depend on the scale of your probe. Same for QCD, quarks and the gluons are fields. They can show their particle nature or they can show their more wave natures. So in this school, you will find I need a hard probe because I try to use the perturbative calculator probe to control the observable. My hard probe will localize parton to demonstrate, to show its a particle nature. But momentum fraction can be very changing. You will see here the talk from Ben Yuan later. When the X is small, you have a longitudinal record of long range. 
you will see wave feature of the gluons in the longitudinal direction. So very, very, very important of part quartz gluon, not particles. They are the fields. They can show the particle nature. They can show the wave nature, depend on the observable. So in order to see the hydronic structure, we need a new type of observable, have two scales, distinct scale, a natural observing experiment. One scale is so hard, I localized to the particle nature. Another scale, I want to see the soft square C, be sensitive hydronic dependence. So that's exactly, uh, say, what the TMD and GPD will do. So I gave you a quick example, say, Joy Yang. We talk about Joy Yang. How can you have this kind of two scale observable? I take a simple one, Joy Yang. Remember that two PDF convolute with a hard part, that's a total called one scale problem, depending on one hard scale. But they don't have to. I can measure Joy Yang by electron pair. They have large invariant mass, but I can also measure their transverse momentum. So imagine I have a hard collision, a produced dielectron pair, the transverse momentum of a pair actually prefer to be small because in the central mass frame, the leading contribution is the transverse momentum equal to zero. So that observable d sigma dq square at dqt can give you both the single scale if the qt is out of a q, and a two scale if a QT is much less than Q. So in that case, initial shower radiation will be sensitive to scale dependence. So that gives you the transverse momentum dependent distribution. Factorization is still true. I can have a pinch singularity so that partons are on show. But a parton in this case, I have, cannot drop that KT. I have to keep that KT because KT will be sensitive to the transverse momentum of a pair you observe in the final state. So the factorization formula will depend on the TMDs. That's where Ian will tell you more in his talk. But there's one thing I want to bring everyone's attention is conceptually. The transverse momentum you from observe from a hard collision is not same as the transverse momentum of proton in the proton wave functions. Once you break the proton in the hard collision, you generate the shower. Of the gluon, just like in the QED, you know, particle change acceleration. You know, if I have an acceleration, you radiate. So you have a lot of gluon radiation. This part of the, in principle QCD evolution, but it's not necessarily pure perturbity. So you have to understand the difference between what you observe from a hard collision and what's in the hydron structure. That's a challenging part. So now find. Finally, this is the last slide, but I want to show a slide. Lepton hydron is a special because uh, I mentioned earlier for Joy Yang, give you a two scale. The lepton hydron scary, if you inclusive the Rossifer experiment, it's a single scale. We study a lot. But if you look at the semi inclusive process, if you look for the scale electron plus the hydron, a pion in the final state, if you assume one photon exchange, the photon-proton collision, momentum is conserved if you produce another hydron, where the hydron can go. Most likely it can go backwards because it preserves momentum. If you go to high transverse momentum, you have to have another particle to balance the transverse momentum. So the lepton hydron scaling will produce both single-scale observable as well as the two-scale observable. They also be sensitive to the GPD. So let me stop here. That's my second lecture with identify hydron. You see the one hydron, two hydron, three hydron. What's the condition required to prove the factorization? Any questions? <laughs> okay, so the microphone on for any questions first. Uh, when you were going over uh, projecting out the F2 structure function, and you were saying that you need to be careful because when you're taking the trace of the metric, it's no longer four, it's four minus two epsilon. Okay. So you had this like a one minus epsilon or something times F2. And that's what I've seen in literature too for other kinds of projecting out. Uh, either form factors or structure functions. Um, um, 
Is that a redefinition of F2 or would you divide it no. over and then have to expand that one over one minus epsilon to, to accurately? Uh, no, it's not the redefinition. F2 is still the same definition. The one minus epsilon coming from the trace of the Jimmy mu, you can track it. I go back to this slide, I can see, show you, you will see that much clearer. Yeah, so before these, you see this formula. This is the decomposition. So in order to extract F1, F2, what are we going to do? I'm going to contract Jimmy Mu, take the trace in the things, take trace from both sides. Then you get a formula in the F1, F2. I take a P Mu, P Mu on the both sides because Q Mu contract is zero. I only have a two vectors for current conservation. So then I have two equations, two unknown F1, F2, then I solve them to get this relation F1, F2 equal to that. But you know, if you go to D dimension, when I have G mu mu contract the W, then G mu mu will contract the G mu mu, that's no longer full. So end up with an epsilon dependent. So I, when I solve, I just put in the, the way you have this projection, you solve that equation with epsilon, just a, it's a tradition, like you say, everybody use that, put the one minus epsilon in front of it. But you can move that one of us down to the right hand side as divided by one over epsilon, you have a definition F2. F2 by definition is still the same definition, but it's only representing the n dimension due to the kinematical variable. You when you contract this tensor with the G mu mu and the P mu mu, get epsilon dependence. So it's it's assuming that the W mu nu on the right hand side, that's going to have the one over epsilons and the one over epsilon squared. So that's that's right. Okay. You, you will have you will have that. Yeah. So it is still there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and then I, I guess while I'm here, I just had one other question about the sure. three hadron thing. Uh -huh. Sure. When I picture scattering, I I always just picture it happens two at a time, not three. So I, I guess I'm a little confused how something like just time ordering of events doesn't uh, eliminate that problem. Very of, good. Uh, so so what happened is uh, uh, in terms of time order, you think about time order. So suppose this hot collision take place at the time scale one over cube. In this case, a high PT, the one over PT. That's a short distance time. If I say this is no at the, this moment, then all the dynamics taking place in the sense compared to this in the past. Then all dynamics here in the past, the two hadrons, they can interact within themselves. When they have collision, it's only the one leading parton, another leading parton collide at the time equal to zero. Then you produce parton at the time scale. Again, it's a one over PT, it's a zero. So this part time we go out, the hydronization take place is another order of Fermi, it's much later. So in terms of time order, you, the each hydron, they have internal dynamics take place at the past. Then at the now, at the moment, there's a hot collision only to do, produce a high PT part time. The part time have to hydronize, the hydronization process take much later, the order of Fermi. So in that case, especially after boost, even longer, so they, this hydron is formed at a much later time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Questions in the room? Any questions on Zoom? I'm not be able to hear you, so raise your hand or use the Oh, today's hand clear. Sasha, in the room? Yeah, yeah I have, uh, I have uh, just a simple question. You have shown that there are a few very small deviations between predictions from electric theory, PCD, and standard model. Which channels are these, and do people take it seriously? Uh, like this? I'll try to, I missed the first uh, part. Yeah. You have shown that there are deviations. Uh, on cross section prediction uh, from uh, standard uh, model and uh, from experiment uh, measurement. Which channels are this? And do people take this deviation seriously? And oh, yes. Models? Yeah. Uh, believe me, all my high energy colleagues take every deviation very seriously, try to find new physics. Yeah, I can show you the slide then. So, so if you look at then the most of the event for 
say the PP collision total cross section that you try to prove the root estimate person whether a violation for Sabon or other things. And also you have the, the uh, photo production, JOM, WZ production, TT bar production, pair. Then to the point, the part you have a, a W, you tag the W plus multiple jet. So in that case, two jet final state. And so in that case, you have to be extremely careful because it, uh, W is electric weak particle. Then I'll give you one simple example, make life a little bit simpler, the Higgs production. If a Higgs production to the decay, say to the two photon, in that case, you, it's like a Joyan process. We prove factorization then for inclusive cross section. But if you start to measure Higgs as transverse momentum distributions, then the transverse momentum distribution from QCD, you can say if it can be factorized the TMD, I'm sure you are going to talk about it. They can handle from the low PT Higgs production versus the high PT, you can have a systematic way. But there is also possible if you combine QCD electroweak theory as a whole theory together, in principle, I can exchange a W particle, a uh, weak interaction particle between the beam jet and the, the Higgs particle. Then the whole proof of the cancellation global singularity in QCD is some of the old hydronic final state, I mean the QCD part, I cancel that. But if I do the QED, include QED, then I, when I sum all the, in principle, you can have a global singularity from a QED, a Q, electric weak theory. But I cannot sum all the final state because Higgs itself have, can, can interact with weak particle. So that, that will lead to break factorization, but the question you can show that break is small. In a factorization, break of factorization, not the end of the day, even the Joyan cross section, beyond one over Q square, you know, took 20 years for people to prove the leading power, took a George and I, already showed less than one year to prove the next leading power, the factorization is true, demonstrate anything beyond that will not be true. But anything beyond that, it's always there, never disappear. But we neglect them, they're small. For the electric weak case, in principle, I can break the factorization for the weak interaction, but so long as they're small, I can still measure that this uh, PT spectrum of Higgs production to test uh, the, all the dynamic of Higgs, unless I reach to precision, be sensitive to their breaking. Uh, is this precision reached already? Uh, I, don't I don't know. People have been returned, <laughs> including me. No, I didn't write the paper yet. I know the others, but I'm thinking about that too. <laughs> I'll ask for clarification on this picture. Yeah. So the jet case involving the two things, the jet is observable, hydronic observable. Then, it, yeah. We make, I gave you an even simpler example. Recently, have a lot of, it's a, in a, the handbook. We mentioned as a semi cool DIS, you can say if I have a exchange of the electron with a proton scattering by exchanging one photon. So then, you, you know, ideally, you know the photon momentum, so you can define photon hydron frame. So as I mentioned, because photons are virtual, hydrons are real, if you produce a single particle, which is possible for momentum conservation, leading contribution particle better to go around the same line. Otherwise, if you go to the transverse moment, you have to have something else to balance the transverse moment. So that's a transverse momentum distribution is exactly sensitive to so-called DMD. So we look for the internal structure. But you realize that whole approach with one problem. If you electron scatter with a proton, not only the core, not scatter with the core, core to radio grew on, so that's how you develop into the, all the TMD factorization. But electron can radio photon too. Because once your electron have a large momentum transfer, electron radio photon. So when the electron radio photons is you never measure every single photon. So what happened, the direction of that exchange of photon is not well defined. So all the formula relying on photon hydron scattering have a problem. So historically for inclusive one, people call radio correction. So calculate some high order correction, reduce to the, uh, the effectively as a single photon scattering. For inclusive might be okay, there's some problem. We have a long paper to explain, especially my JHAP paper, the section 2.4, I put on the purpose to explain even inclusive, there's certain kinematic region for yes, you look for small X region where they have a huge phase space for radiation, that could be a problem. 
But if you look for another hydrogen in the final state, you also send you angle modulation between, you know, scale lepton define one plane, coming hydrogen with scale hydrogen define another plane, angle modulation, Ian is going to tell you how to separate different TMD because we have a three type of PDF, the unpolarized, polarized, transverse polarized. But once you allow the transverse momentum, you have eight TMD. How can we separate them? Took 40 years, we learned enough to pin down the PDL. What can you learn to factor? But the angle modulation depend on spin of the exchange. So you'll be able to separate them. But if you don't know the frame, photon hydrogen frame, the whole angle modulation changes. So that's, but how to do that? What we do is combine the QED, QCD, treat the equal footing to the factorization. You have to do the same power counting, then eventually you do the consistently. Then you will realize there's a number of issues, just like electroweak case I mentioned. So those are still challenged because we spend more than $2 billion, at least we plan to spend, to build the electron ion collider. This kind of issues is have to be addressed before you can have a precision measurement. It's in a, one of the subsection of the, the handbook will tell you the reference where to find it. Okay, thank you. I think let's thank John Wei for the whole morning session. Okay. Great for you for here in person. I need a air. Yeah, that's a problem. The oxygen. Yeah, oxygen is a problem. I'll open the meeting again just before 2 p.m. Thank <laughs> you.